Today, we're uncovering the secrets of Yu-Gi-Oh! Here's the moment I'm sure most of you have been waiting for, the villains, the Doma organization. Personally, I feel that they are the best group of antagonists of the Duel Monsters era. Starting with Raphael, whose cards legitimately could have pushed the Guardian archetype into meta-relevance. Backup Gardena, the poster child of anime exclusives that everyone and their mother wanted to see in the physical game, is a level 4 dark warrior effect monster with 500 attack and 2200 defense, which has the non once per turn effect to select an equipped equip card on the field and equip it to another appropriate target on the field. And when this face up card is selected as an attack target, you can discard one card to negate the attack. In the theme of guardians, this is clearly meant to give each guardian monster their namesake weapon. Outside of that, I could potentially see this working with Infernobles to grant the different effect of Infernoble Arms equip spells to your different monsters when needed. Aid to the Doomed is a quick play spell card which you can activate from your hand during your opponent's turn by discarding two cards from your hand. When a monster you control is destroyed, end the battle phase of this turn. There are other cards that you could use in place of this for much better payoff, of which I've exhausted the names of, and the only benefit this card has over them is being a hand trap of sorts. Getting into more Guardian focus support, we have Guardian Force, a counter trap card that can only be activated while there are no Guardian monsters in your graveyard. Card. Negate the activation of an opponent's spell card and destroy it. For those uninformed, keeping monsters out of the graveyard was a theme of Raphael's deck, which we'll see more in his remaining cards, and a lot of his cards either got their effects by having no guardians in the graveyard, or took control of what was going into the graveyard. As for this card, it's certainly not bad, but it's asking quite a lot for a one-time negation. Guardian Formation is a normal trap card that can only be activated when a face-up guardian monster you control is selected as an attack target. Negate the attack and move that monster to an unoccupied monster card zone for some reason. Then you can activate one spell card from your hand or deck. Well, that last sentence took this card from 0 to 100 real quick. Any spell card is crazy. Surprisingly, the last card strictly tied to the Guardian archetype is Guardian Shield, an equipped spell card that can only be equipped to a Guardian monster. It gains 300 defense. If a Guardian monster you control would be destroyed by battle, you can destroy this card instead. Eh. Still leaning pretty close to LOB style equip spells, but Substitute for Destruction is a nice touch and goes into the controlling your graveyard aspect of Raphael's deck. Let's look at more like that. Self Tribute, a quick play spell card which can be activated if one or more monsters you control would be destroyed. Pay 1000 life points. Those monsters cannot be destroyed this turn. I do at least like that this card goes a step above by covering any form of destruction, so I won't make my typical comparisons to Waboku. Every villain in Yu-Gi-Oh needs their own mass destruction type of card and Raphael is no exception. Spirit Hunting is a normal trap card that destroys all defense position monsters your opponent controls by changing the battle position of one monster you control as cost. Damn. Red Dragon Archfiend has just always been a thing, hasn't it? That cost is pretty funny to include though, seeing that it's nearly non-existent. Next up is Crystal Seal, a continuous trap card which locks down one monster your opponent controls. That monster cannot attack, be tributed, change its battle position, activate its effects, or be selected as an attack target. If your opponent controls no other monsters, monsters you control can attack your opponent directly. If the attack of that monster changes, destroy this card. This card cannot be destroyed by other card effects. Pretty good, all things considered, and really the only upgrade you could add to a modern import of this card would be that it doesn't target the opponent's monster, and also prevents it from being used as extra deck material. Other than that, I'll take three copies. Going back to what was supposed to be the theme of this deck, Rescuer from the Grave is a normal spell card that does nothing until it's in the graveyard, so we're gonna need to stock up on foolish burial goods. When an opponent's monster declares an attack while this card is in your graveyard, you can remove from play 5 cards from your graveyard to negate the attack and end the battle phase. It's a gimmick, no doubts about it, but I like it. You don't have to banish this card along with the 5 from your graveyard, so this can be used at any time you meet the requirements. But that requirement is extremely hefty and makes more sense as to why there are several discard costs on Raphael's cards. In similar fashion to how Yu-Gi-Oh! Elitist will antagonize casual players for not playing the best deck, 
Raphael does the same to Yugi for not keeping his monsters out of the graveyard. Purity of the Cemetery is the epitome of this, a continuous spell card that can only be activated if you have no monsters in your graveyard. During each of your opponent's standby phases, inflict 100 damage to your opponent for each monster in your opponent's graveyard. If there is a monster card in your graveyard, destroy this card. You're definitely not getting very far off this, especially in the modern game. You might get a solid 1000 to 1200 damage in on a single standby phase before your opponent gets rid of this card. Or you get nothing from this because your opponent puts a monster in your graveyard before their turn even starts. I am not willing to gamble on it. But something that Konami is always willing to gamble on is the relevance of battle positions. I can assure you that aside from flip effect monsters needing to be face down, battle positions have never mattered. On that note, Obedience is a normal spell card that during the turn it was activated, when a monster on the field with the highest attack attacks a defense position monster, change the attack target to face up attack position. That is definitely a thing that it does, I guess, and that thing that it does is not very good, unless it specifically puts a monster in attack position that opens up enough damage to swing for game. Hopefully it's not a man-eater bug getting flipped face up. Second to last is Limit Tribute, a continuous trap card that makes it so both players can only tribute one monster per turn. Behold, every Monarch player's worst nightmare, and every other player's bolt card that they don't remember pulling from a booster pack. This is entirely irrelevant. Finally, Raphael's best card in my opinion is Nightmare Binding, a normal spell card that has you select one face-up monster your opponent controls. It loses 800 attack, then you gain 800 life points. That monster's effects cannot be activated and it cannot be tributed. Leagues ahead of every other card in his catalog, but Raphael goes out with a bang on this one. Simple, effective, really only beaten by immunity to targeting, but there is still a lot that you can pull off with this card. As I said in the beginning, Alistair is my overall favorite character because of his cards. A mix of military meets Gundam and polar opposite Fire Fiend, but all nine of them pack a punch. Starting with his Gundam lineup, Sky Union is a normal spell card that special summons one Air Fortress Ziggurat from your deck by tributing three monsters you control. It sounds like it's easier said than done, but in combination with his Tank Core Trap card, which we covered in the Token episode, getting three monsters on board is no problem. But if you're not feeling the token route, your next option comes in the form of two cards that will leave your opponent begging for mercy. Junk Dealer, another fan favorite, is a normal spell card where you select up to two machine type or warrior type monsters in your graveyard, special summon them in attack position, and have their original attack. Monsters summoned by this effect cannot attack or be tributed for a tribute summon this turn. Any deck that works with either of these monster types would love to have this easy recovery tool. And the next card gives you the perfect targets to grab. Soldier Revolt, a normal trap card that can only be activated while you control a face-up Science Soldier, Cyber Soldier of Dark World, and Kinetic Soldier during your main phase. Send your opponent's hand to the graveyard and destroy all cards on your opponent's side of the field. You cannot conduct your battle phase this turn. That's alright because your opponent is now stuck in a top deck challenge facing down the mighty machine summoned by Sky Union. Air Fortress Ziggurat, a level 8 wind machine effect monster with 2500 attack and 800 defense. This card cannot be normal summoned or set, and this card cannot be special summoned except with Sky Union. This card is unaffected by the effects of your opponent's spell and trap cards. During each of your end phases, special summon one robot token in defense position. That token cannot declare an attack. While you control a robot token, your opponent cannot select another monster you control as an attack target except robot token. So, you've wiped out your opponent's resources and have now faced them with a nearly indestructible monster. Overall, my preferred version of his deck, but the fun doesn't stop there. You may recall in the token episode that a monster was mentioned when talking about the card Tank Core. Here it is. KC-1 Creighton, a level 4 earth machine effect monster with 1500 attack and 1200 defense, and this card gains 500 attack for each tank token you control. Unassuming at first, but in combination with Tank Core, which can only be activated if you control Creighton, grants this monster an automatic boost of 1500. That's a big boy right there. Going into Alistair's Fire Fiend theme, we start with Gorlag, a level 4 Fire Fiend effect monster with 1000 attack and defense. And this card gains 500 attack for each face-up fire monster on the field, meaning you can reach a whopping 5500 on monsters alone. 
Consider your timber shivered, Snake Eye. When this card destroys an opponent's monster by battle and sends it to the graveyard, special summon that monster to your side of the field in face-up attack position at the end of the battle phase. That monster is treated as a fire monster and its effects are negated. When this card is removed from the field, destroy all monsters special summoned by this card's effect. I would immediately add a fire focus deck to my arsenal if we receive this card in the TCG. And to add to that, we have a Tonic's Flame, a normal spell card which destroys all monsters on the field other than Fire Fiend type monsters. You can special summon one Fire Fiend type monster from your graveyard. You cannot declare an attack during the turn you activate this card. My Infernoids are making it out of the binder with this one, Chief, and the next card, while it doesn't strictly reside in a Fire Fiend deck, is still an excellent choice. Fire Whip, a normal spell card that allows you to special summon all monsters destroyed this turn to your side of the field. Those monsters are treated as fire monsters. Dark Hole, Fire Whip. That's all I'm gonna say. Alistair's last card doesn't really have any relation to either of his deck themes. Truth be told, it shouldn't exist. Contagion of Madness, a quick play spell card that can be activated only when an opponent's monster declares a direct attack. Inflict damage to your opponent equal to half that monster's attack at the same time you take battle damage. I really wish they didn't waste such a garbage effect on such a cool name. There's also no reason for this to be a spell card. Where did it all go wrong? Also, <coughs> MAGIC CYLINDER! Darts, our last character for this week, has 10 exclusives, almost exclusively connected to the Seal of Orichalcos. Which serves to remind all of us that the Seal of Orichalcos could have been so much better outside of a standalone promotional card, especially considering that this arc basically had two dedicated collection boxes. But that's neither here nor there. Starting with the only two cards unrelated to the Orichalcos, Martyr Curse is a normal trap card that can be activated when a monster you control is destroyed. Force one of your monsters and one opponent's monster to battle. At this time, your opponent cannot activate their monster's effects. Other than forcing your opponent to battle one of your monsters that have a floating effect, I'm drawing a blank as to where you'd want to run something like this. And the next card fits into that same category. Twin Bow Centaur, a continuous spell card, and during the turn you activate this card, you cannot declare an attack. On a soft once per turn, you can select one monster you control and one monster your opponent controls, then toss a coin. If you call it right, remove from play the monster your opponent controls and inflict damage to your opponent equal to the original attack of that monster. If you call it wrong, remove from play the monster you control and take damage equal to the original attack of that monster. Some very strong Brooklyn inspiration with this one in all of the wrong ways. I like Banish and Burn effects as much as the next guy, but I'd much rather have my battle phase for that turn. And unless you can consistently put three of these on board at the same time, and call three coin tosses correctly, I'm not sure why you would opt in for this. My biggest gripe though, with zero relation to the card effect, is that this artwork screams that this card would be a throwaway secret rare, and that hurts my soul. What also hurts my soul is Orichalcos, because I imagine having your soul ripped out of your body is at least a little bit painful. Orichalcos Shuneros was one of the few Orichalcos monsters that were actually imported to the physical game, and it's awful. That being the case, unfortunately some of the cards we'll talk about that mention Shuneros would need to be completely reworked, but let's look at what their original effects entailed. Orichalcos Aristeros, a level 4 dark fairy effect monster with zero attack and question mark defense. This card cannot be normal summoned or set. This card cannot be special summoned except with Orichalco Shunoros. This card cannot be destroyed while you control Orichalco Shunoros. When an opponent's monster declares an attack, change the attack target to this card. And the defense of this card becomes equal to the attack of the attacking monster plus 300 during the damage step only. After damage calculation, one Orichalco Shunoros you control loses attack equal to the defense this card had during the damage step. So this would need to be reworded to special summoning itself while you control a face-up Shunoros. Other than that, it's okay. Orichalco's Dexia is basically the exact same monster but with question mark attack. Can't be normal summoned or set and has to be special summoned with Shuneros, which would have to be reworded in the same way as Aristeros, and it can't be destroyed while you control Shuneros. When this card battles with your opponent's monster, the attack of this card becomes equal to either that attack position monster's attack or that defense position monster's defense, plus 300 until the end of the damage step. After damage calculation, one Orichalco Shuneros you control loses attack equal to the attack this card had during the damage step. Again, it's just okay. 
Orichalcos Gygus, another monster that fans have been clamoring for a physical release of, is a level 4 Dark Fiend effect monster with 400 attack and 1500 defense. When this card is destroyed, you can special summon it immediately, but it cannot attack for the rest of the turn. When this card is special summoned by its own effect, skip your next draw phase. This card gains 500 attack times the number of times it was special summoned by its own effect during this duel. It's lost a bit of relevance because very few decks have any use for a continuously spawning low level monster. However, this is still a decent effect. At the very least, you pretty much always have a Link 1 ready to go as soon as this monster hits the field. And on its best day, depending on how incapacitated your opponent is, they'll repeatedly attack into Gygus and you'll have a massive body on the field. Ori Calco's Malevolence is a card that I completely forgot existed and for good reason. But it's a level 4 Fire Fiend effect monster with 1500 attack and 1000 defense. And once per turn, you can select one defense position monster your opponent controls and change it to face up attack position. Oh my god! Wow! Ori Calco's Qtora is a level 3 Dark Fiend effect monster with 500 attack and defense. And this card cannot be normal summoned or set. You can special summon this card from your hand by paying 500 life points. As a non once per turn, that makes me happy. While this card is on the field, all battle damage you take from battles involving monsters you control becomes zero. When this card is destroyed, special summon one Orikalko Shunaros from your hand, deck, or graveyard. See, Kutora over here understood the assignment. Easy field presence, mitigating battle damage, although I thought that this monster absorbed the battle damage into its attack points and boosted itself with every attack from your opponent, but that's probably the Mandela effect. And a seamless floating effect. This card has everything. Ori Calco Sword of Sealing keeps up the pressure, an equipped spell card that requires you to discard one card that you drew this turn to activate it, and then it negates the effects of the equipped monster. Sadly, this doesn't aid in getting around any monsters immune to targeting effects, but still a nifty tool. The most interesting aspect of the Seal of Ori Calcos when used by darts was his ability to strengthen the seal in the form of new cards, those being the field spells Ori Calcos Duraros and Tritos. Duraros holds all of the original effects of the Seal of Ori Calcos, but now cannot be destroyed by card effects up to twice per turn. And during the end phase, the controller gains 300 life points for every monster they control. And Duraros can only be activated by banishing the original seal. Tridos holds the effect of the original seal and Duraros, but is now fully indestructible by card effects. It also has the addition to negate a spell or trap card that targets a monster you control on a soft once per turn. And Tridos can only be activated by banishing Duraros. I would say that Tridos has the potential to see play in the modern game, but needing to run the standard Seal of Ori Calcos and Duraros, which is only a slight upgrade, really takes this card out of the meta's favor. The Waking the Dragon's Arc is polarizing for a reason. These cards are either really, really good or really, really below average. There's not a whole lot of in between. But that's going to wrap up this week's episode of The Secrets of Yu Gi Oh! Let me know your thoughts. What cards do you want to see from the Waking the Dragons arc make it to the physical game? Drop a comment down below. If you like the video, don't forget to drop a big thumbs up. It's greatly appreciated, as always, guys. And until next time, this has been Purple Pineapple TV. Signing off.